Hi there, Simon from simonwood.com. I'm going to a 50th birthday party later on this evening, and uh, so I thought I might as well open these bottles of sparkling wine now and uh, drink half of each of them and then go up. No, no, no. Drink a tiny little bit, or even just taste a little bit of it, of uh, each of them, and then go along and party, party, party. Um, so we've got three different countries represented here. We've got two Proseccos, two Champagnes, and they're sandwiching an English sparkling wine. So let's just dig in and see how we get on. First one we have La Castella Prosecco uh, from Italy, in case you didn't uh, uh, know that Prosecco came from Italy. There, uh, there's this thing at the moment where uh, the uh, Italians or the Prosecco people are up in arms about people in other countries you, uh, you making grapes from a grape which everyone has known for ages as Prosecco, but which, which now apparently we have to call Glera. Uh, yes, G-L-E-R-A, not very uh, memorable name, but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's to stop people. There's Prosecco coming from, uh, uh, being planted in Brazil, there's Prosecco here from New Zealand, I think there's some in Australia, but now it can't be called Prosecco, it's just going to say on Glera. Oh well. Politics, let's give it this, give, get away from the politics and have a taste. Now, Prosecco for me is sometimes the Pinot Grigio of the wine world, and what I mean by that is j there is some excellent Pinot Grigio and there is some excellent Prosecco, and there's a lot of so so stuff. Most of it simple, inoffensive. This feels like it's sort of going into that bracket. Um, it's got that uh, slightly, what I call the apple spume character. Soft apple, uh, ever so slight hint of nail varnish and something like that. If I've got something against it as that style of Prosecco, not all that ambitious, but perfectly pleasant, it does feel like it's it's lost maybe a little bit of freshness, but let's taste it and see. It's okay. It's just that little bit confected. The, 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 you're left with this impression of softness. Um, yeah, that vague apple. Uh, maybe a little touch of um, stoniness about it, but not great. It's okay. I, I'd finish the glass. I wouldn't have another one. Let's see how the second Prosecco goes. Um, if you're a Spanish, turn away now because this is called a uh, Foyador, um, which uh, means something horrible in Spanish. Uh, but uh, this is Italian and it's uh, Prosecco uh, de, from uh, Valdobbiadini. Um, and um, this, uh, so this is a step up from here. And it's a step up in price, uh, but should be a step up in quality too. Two things I noticed, first of all, uh, and it's not as um, bimbo-like and in-your-face. Also, it feels like it's gonna, this is going to be fresher. It feels like it's a fresher, more precise, uh, more sense of the place rather than just a, a few processes here. So there's that stony minerality alongside this, uh, this uh, citrus and apple flavour. feels like it's, it's not going to be as soft and maybe as fleshy as the first one, but um, a finer wine. And that's pretty good. Um, yes, it's got this, uh, uh, it, it is a, a touch off dry, so you're getting this roundness to it, but uh, powering through it all, there's this uh, layers, layers and layers of fruit, so there's a bit of peach, there's a bit of apple, and there's a bit of citrus, uh, but there's also this stony minerality. It got a touch of that in the first one, but here it's a much more precise, um, focused wine. And uh, uh, it's got the freshness, it's got the bite, zip, life. Um, pretty tasty wine, actually. Two quite different faces of Prosecco there. Um, hey, uh, let's see how we get on with England. Uh, we, we are on Chapel Down at Chapter 2. And this is a special blend uh, that's been put together by the guys at Chapel Down for a restaurant called Roast in London. Let's give it a whirl and see whether it something we'll be toasting with our roasting. I'll shut up and sniff. It's got some of that smoky elderflower, slight underripeness that I get in quite a lot of English wines. It's a cool climate, and uh, it's uh, we can't ripen things as well as well as um, as other countries. But it has got some uh, finesse about it. It feels like there's the fruit's not gushing out of the glass. Um, it would, I think, if they'd, if they'd had the chance to uh, uh, leave it on the leaves for another couple of years, I think some of that smoky underripeness would have uh, would have mellowed out. Uh, but as it is, it smells like it's going to be fresh, appetising, but one of those that, if you're having it by itself, might just be a bit too acidic to have uh, more than one glass. Um, but uh, dig into it with some smoked salmon, that's a different picture entirely. And I get though that like, like, like lemon, lemon zestiness about it, uh, but this smoky elderflower, uh, the, the, the bit of underripeness in there. Maybe there's a touch of red berry too. 
feels fresh, bracing, um, and uh, yes, I, I would want something slightly fat and oily to uh, to have in between each mouthful of that. It's okay, um, but uh, I would have liked something a little bit either more lees aging to soften it out, or somewhere from something from a little, somewhere a little warmer. Let's get on to the two champagnes. Uh, first one is Moet's uh, Vintage 2002. Give it a whirl. This smells really rich and toasty, almost as if so there's been a bit of wood ageing. We'll get onto that with the next one. We'll talk about wood and champagne in a moment. I don't think there's any wood being used anywhere in the, in the, in the, uh, in the making of this. But it's got this real, uh, slightly, you know, if you, if you uh, put bread in the oven rather than put bread in the toaster and it comes out that sort of toasty crispness. It's got that type of character. Then uh, the more exuberant, the fruitiness comes through. There's a bit of those hazelnuts. There's a bit of the uh, uh, crystallised pineapple and touches of citrus. It smells like it's going to be quite rich, uh, but smells like it's going to be quite tasty too. It's very tasty. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a rich, broad champagne. Some, some champagnes want to be svelte and elegant. This wants to be... A bit of a party animal almost, uh, but it's a, a party element, a, a animal that's got a little bit of decorum about it. Um, the, the wines it reminds me of, it reminds me of uh, some of the ones that, uh, um, uh, that Charles and Piper, uh, Charles and, uh, uh, yeah, Charles and P Piper Heidsick, Piper we're supposed to call it, uh, the, the, the P&C Heidsick uh, um, stable, things like Champagne Charlie, it reminds me, it reminds me of that style, quite broad, toasty, rich, uh, a lot of yeastiness in there, uh, but lots of bouncy, rich, honest flavour, so if you want subtlety, go elsewhere, but if you want really quite classy, but full flavours. This is this is really good. Uh, I had the Moet uh, non-vintage uh, a while ago, and I was a bit disappointed with it. But um, this is uh, this is uh, pretty decent grog. Let's see whether we're on pretty decent grog with the last one. And I was sort of talking about wood. This is Bilcar Samos Champagne Brut Sous Bois. Uh, under wood, not under milk wood, uh, but uh, yeah, this is um, a champagne where they've uh, the base wine's been fermented and aged in oak prior to the champanization, for want of a better term. I don't think it's a vintage wine, so, but uh, it doesn't say how, how old uh, the the various bits are that go in there, but. Um, it, some champagnes have, uh, yeah, once upon a time all champagne would have been aged in oak, but it would have been these big old barrels. Uh, now there are some people experimenting with the smaller barrels, and sometimes the, uh, the wines work, sometimes they're just a bit too oaky for their own good. Which one is this? Let's have a see. Or a sniff. Well, it's a bit odd. It um, feels like there's two wines here at the moment. There's a quite a big, fat, creamy one uh, with a little bit of that uh, buttery edge of malolactic fermentation. And then there's a finer element, uh, a more, more classic champagne. So you've got those a slight, ever so slight yeasty, toasty notes and those fine fruits, a bit of, a bit of apple and a bit of citrus in there. Uh, maybe it's something verging onto the uh, peach stroke apricot. Um, uh, but almost the sort of wine that, on first sniff, uh, a wine that I want to open and maybe even decant. Uh, a decanting champagne can do wonders for uh, some young, vigorous wines and uh, really, really get um, get more of their their full characters come out. Uh, which champagne often doesn't get a chance to because we just sort of swig it back as if it's uh, uh, upmarket pop. And the more it, the more it, it, it opens up in the glass, the more those two smells actually come together, and you're left with this um, intriguing thing. The, the creaminess calms down, um, and um, uh, yeah, the, the the more elegant champagne characters come more to the fore. Both have their place. Uh, I, in, in terms of uh, woodiness, like a smoky oak or anything like that, I don't really get too much of that character. But maybe if the wood's good doing anything to the wine, it's this softness and roundness. The Moet jumped out and grabbed you. This one is much more subtle and, feel, as I was saying, feels like I want to decant it, give it a chance to uh, to come out of its shell. It feels like there's a coiled core here. Um, uh, it's probably based on uh, vintages that weren't quite as uh, full and hello and friendly like as the as the uh, uh, as the 2002 with the, with the Moet, and it's a younger wine. Uh, so uh, yes, it feels like a, it's it, it's one of those that needs to come out of its shell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have another swirl and a sniff now. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave a glass or two, uh, and maybe uh, when I at Mark's party tonight, I'll stash a bit away in a corner and see how it's going to be in about five hours. Um, but yes, I mean, don't be afraid of decanting your champagne, and don't be afraid of giving it a proper glass to uh, let it express its true venosity. That's whininess to you and me. I 
find it intriguing rather than very classy. I think of uh, the, the normal Bilkar um, wines, and I think of something like the, what's it called, Cuvée NF Bilkar. Uh, that for me is a pretty cla classy, poised wine. Here, it's got the, maybe the woodiness and the creaminess is just adding a little bit more brashness and vulgarity than I want. But as I say, that may calm down with time. Whether it will be given the chance, that depends on your demeanour. But um, here, today, it will do. Maybe it won't with you. So maybe you go for the Moet instead. Hey. But they're both pretty tasty. See you soon.